Yes, yes, this is one of my favorite videos in the Machine Learning Foundation series. In it, we'll use the Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse to solve for unknowns, enabling us to fit a line to points with linear algebra alone. When I first learned how to do this, it blew my mind. I hope it blows your mind too. The Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse, which we denote as, say, for the matrix A as A superscript plus, the Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse, however we annotate it, is mega useful because non-square matrices are common in machine learning. So consider the example that we discussed already a couple of times earlier in this Machine Learning Foundation series where we are using um, various attributes of a house to predict house value. So where Y is our house price that we're predicting, and then we have various uh, inputs into our model, like the number of bedrooms in the house could be this first model input, and then distance from school could be this other model input, all the way through to M model inputs. And in this kind of situation, we would typically have, you know, maybe a dozen features that we input into our model to predict house price, but we could have lots of houses. We wouldn't, it would be really bizarre actually, if we had exactly as many houses in our data set as we had features. I mean, so let's say we had 12 inputs into our model, then we'd go out and find just 12 houses. That's a silly situation. You would have more data. You would typically have more data in a regression model like this than you have unknowns to solve for. The unknowns here being B, C, and M, which are the weights that we learn for each of the inputs, X1, X2, all the way through to XM. And then we have a Y-intercept A that allows us to have an average house price in this case, so that it's not fixed at zero and pretty much always going to want to have this Y-intercept. So yeah, so we're typically going to have far more rows of data than unknowns to solve for. And so in this case, uh, we might have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of house prices and associated attributes. So, you know, tens of thousands of rows, but only say a dozen features or unknowns in the model. So obviously not a square matrix. And so would not be invertible with just regular matrix inversion, but we can calculate the more Penrose pseudo inverse and solve for the unknowns, solve for A, B, C, and M. So that equation that I just showed you on the preceding slide, we can use linear algebra to make this much cleaner looking representation of the same equation where we uh, use matrix multiplication between a matrix of the inputs into the model as well as a column of ones representing the y-intercept a, so that variable average for whatever y is in, in you know, our house price example so that we can have an average house price. So yeah, so we have this one matrix of inputs into the model, our features that we are predicting y with, that we're predicting our output with, in this case house prices, and we multiply that matrix by a vector of the unknowns that we're trying to learn. So A for our y-intercept, B for this first feature, say the number of bedrooms in the house, and C is distance from school and so on, all the way through to M. So yeah, so matrix multiplication to represent the inputs and the unknowns, and then a vector of house prices as our output from this matrix multiplication. So we can represent this regression formula as Y, equals x w, where w is a vector of weights a through m. We talked about all of this, including the last slide, already in the uh, Intro to Linear Algebra subject, the first subject in this Machine Learning Foundation series. We talked about it in detail, but as a quick recap, in that equation, we know the outcomes y. We know we have these values, which could be house prices. We know the features X, which are predictors like bedroom count and distance from school and so on. And then vector W contains our unknowns, the model's learnable parameters, as I just discussed. So assuming that uh, the matrix inverse of X 
exists, you could use matrix inversion to solve for W. And we already talked about this in detail in the intro to linear algebra subjects. So I won't talk about this all in that to that same level of detail again. But the problem that we have here is in this real world scenario where we have a non-square matrix, which has far more rows than it has columns, because we have far more houses in our data set than we have features like bedroom count. So we can't use matrix inversion. In the intro to linear algebra subject, we did use matrix inversion uh, to solve for the unknown weights in this really small model, the system of linear equations. Uh, so you can go back and visit that if you want a recap of matrix inversion. But again, this kind of thing that we were doing here when we had a square matrix, a two by two matrix, where we could invert, that's not possible with our real world house price data set. So this is where the moore penrose pseudo inverse comes to the rescue. Right, it would be unusual to have exactly as many cases, n, so in this case houses, as features are predictors of house price. With the pseudo inverse, x plus, we can now estimate model weights even if n is not equal to n. So we can solve for the unknowns using a variant of the equation that I just showed you on the last couple slides, the matrix inversion equation, where we had x inverse here, the matrix inverse of x. Now we put the pseudo inverse in there. We just plug that in and it allows us to solve for unknowns. This is great. So how does it do it exactly? You don't need to memorize this. Memorizing these next two bullets isn't going to make or break a machine learning or data science career. But just for the sake of completeness, I wanted to spend a moment here talking about it. So if the matrix X is an overdetermined system, so the number of rows is much greater than the number of columns, and we have an overdetermined system like this here, in that kind of situation, the pseudo inverse um, provides a XY matrix multiplication as close to W as possible in terms of Euclidean distance. So L2 norm, you know, plain old distance. Specifically, it finds X times Y minus W and the L2 norm of that uh, difference. In contrast, if X is an underdetermined system where our number of cases is smaller than our number of features, and so you know, this isn't what we would typically see with a regression model, but this is the kind of scenario you might have with a deep learning model. So deep learning models might have millions of features, you know, so M might be a very, very large number, but you might only have thousands or tens of thousands of cases in your data set. And that's that's common in deep learning. So in that kind of situation where you have an underdetermined system, then the pseudo inverse provides the solution to this equation that has the smallest Euclidean norm, L2 norm, from all of the possible solutions. Uh, and it's a bit silly in this super underdetermined system where we only have two dimensions and one line. But uh, it's harder for me to draw these plots in many dimensions where this kind of reasoning that we have here makes sense. So yeah, I don't want you to labor on this too much. You can definitely dig into these details more if you'd like to. And I, at the end of this subject, I have resources for learning more linear algebra in detail. But for our purposes, for being able to apply machine learning algorithms to understand data science better, just knowing that we can calculate a pseudo inverse to approximate the inverse of a matrix when it's non-square, when it can't be inverted properly. And uh, yeah, that's good enough. So let's jump into a hands-on code demo to see this pseudo inverse in action solving for unknowns. All right, so we're back in our linear algebra two subject notebook, and we're just below the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse code that we executed in the preceding video. So now we're here where we're going to tackle a regression problem with the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. So for regression problems, as I mentioned on the slide, we typically have many more cases, um, n or rows of x, than features to predict, or m, or columns of x. 
So let's solve a miniature example of such an overdetermined situation. In this situation, we have eight data points. I've completely made these data points up. So we have this input, which we'll call X1, which is a dosage of a drug that uh, treats Alzheimer's disease. So let's say, you know, milliliters of, of drug dosage. So, you know, you administer zero milliliters, a control or one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to seven milliliters of this Alzheimer's drug. And then our outcome that we're measuring is the forgetfulness of the patient on some test of forgetfulness. I'm just making this stuff up for the sake of an example. All right, so we'll create some labels for our plot. We'll call this a clinical trial. And along our x-axis, we'll put the drug dosage. And along our y-axis, we will put the forgetfulness. So let's plot that out. Pretty simple plot here. We create the plot in matplotlib. We add our title, x label and y label, respectively, with these three lines of code. And then we use a scatter plot to plot our x and y values against each other. So we can see clearly the more drug dosage, the less forgetful our patient is. So our Alzheimer's drug is working and our patient is less forgetful the more drug that we provide to them. So although it appears there is only one predictor here, if we wanna fit a line to these points, we do need a second one, which I'll call x0, in order to allow for the y-intercept. So therefore, our number of columns, m, is equal to two. Our number of rows, n, is equal to eight, because we have eight data points. So this again, uh, having this y-intercept allows the mean outcome to be away from zero. So if you didn't have a y-intercept, you'd be forced to have your line intercept the y-axis here at zero. But as we can tell, the y-intercept is uh, closer to two. So we definitely want, and you'd almost always, it would be very unusual to not have a y-intercept in your model. So the y-intercept is constant across all of our points. And so we set it equal to one across the board. So we can just set x0 equal to an array of ones, uh, eight of them, because we have eight data points. And then now we can concatenate our x0 and x1 vectors into a matrix. So I'm going to transpose both vectors and then concatenate them together, setting axis equal to one so that they're concatenated as columns next to each other. So here's x0 for our y-intercept, and then we have our, our actual varying drug dosage values as the other column in matrix X. All right, so armed with our matrix X, we now have everything we need to start solving for the weights, the weights that will allow us to fit a line to these points. So, from the slides, we know that we can calculate the weights using the equation uh, here, where our weights are equal to the pseudo inverse of x multiplied by y. So we just throw our matrix x here into the numpy pseudo inverse method, and we perform matrix multiplication between that pseudo inverse and our vector y, which contains all of the outcomes the patient's forgetfulness score, the y-axis values. So there you go. These are our weights. That's it. It's that easy. I, my mind was blown completely the first time that I learned this. I didn't know that we could use linear algebra to solve for unknowns like this. And yeah, just totally mind-blowing for me. I hope it is for you too. We've solved that now the y-intercept for this line is equal to 1.76, and the slope of the line is negative 0.5, roughly, negative 0.5. So if the significance of that hasn't sunk in yet, let's now plot things out so you can see it, and maybe then your mind will finally be blown.
So the first weight here corresponds to the y-intercept of the line, which we typically denote as b in a line equation. So this little chunk of code here is just to extract this first value and put it into a, a standalone variable. And then the second weight corresponds to the slope of the line, which again, in the equation of line, we typically denote as m. So let's extract that out of here as well. The difference between these two code chunks being that here I'm asking for the first element and here I'm asking for the second element. Now that we have the weights, we can plot the line to confirm that it fits the points. So these lines of code here are the same as we used earlier to make this plot here, but now we're going to add a line. So we do that with these lines of code here. We find out what the limits of our plot are, and we use that for our lowest x value in the plot through to our highest x value in the plot. And then we use those to plot a line from that lowest x value to the highest x value. So we use the equation of a line uh, m times x plus b to give us our first y value, which uh, corresponds to x min. So slope of the line m times our x min, where x min is the furthest left point, the lowest x value in our chart, x max is the highest x value. We're gonna calculate what y is at this minimum value of x, as well as what y is at this maximum value of x. And that will give us two coordinates for plotting a line. Yeah, so the first one is, so we use the line equation m times x with our low x value, plus our y-intercept b, our y-intercept b, to calculate the left-hand y, value. And then for the right hand y value where x is uh, maxed out, that's again our slope times x max now plus the same y intercept b. And then we can plot them out. So here we go. We just use the plot method here to plot from those points. So from our first point where x is equal to x min and y is equal to this and to our uh, right-hand point where x is equal to x max and y is equal to the, uh, the result of the line equation with x max going in as the input. So there you go. Our line fits our points very, very well. And this is all thanks to linear algebra. Uh, we didn't need any fancy machine learning because we just have a few data points. And yeah, the more Penrose pseudo inverse saves the day, even though we can't invert. Wow, pseudo inversion is awesome. What a way to approach the end of the linear algebra theory covered in my machine learning foundation series. Up next is a quick video on the trace operator, the final little piece of linear algebra theory in the entire series. See you there. To be sure not to miss the next tutorial in this series, subscribe to my channel. Thanks for taking part in the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and comment. To be sure not to miss any of my content, head to johncrone.com and sign up for my email newsletter. You're also welcome to add me on LinkedIn. Simply mention that you're a viewer of the Machine Learning Foundation series. You can follow me on Twitter too, if that's your social medium of choice. See you next time.